Did you ever play uh, the mind game, <clears throat> if I were God? Ever do that? Boy, if I was God. Well, let's play that game for a moment, shall we? If I was God. If I was God, and I wanted to give you today, all of you today, one thing that would make your life richer, one gift that would help you cope with the heartaches and the problems in each of your different situations, do you know which gift that would be that I would give? It wouldn't be money, it wouldn't be better health, it wouldn't be a return to youth or perhaps happier marriages, although all these things are desirable, they're good. If I could give you a simple gift that would surpass all of these, it would be to give you the peace of God. Because when you find this, you have found peace of mind. In Philippians chapter four, beginning in verse four, Paul writes the following, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, again I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. You know, money has a way of creating more worries. And health, as we know, Johnny just read the, you know, the prayer cards, health is a pretty fragile thing. We, we may be sitting here this morning healthy and saying, oh, that's too bad for this one, and oh, I got to remember sister so-and-so, she's sick, and by tonight we're on the prayer list. So we know that Health is very fragile. Youth is temporary and usually not appreciated by those who have it. And even happy marriages suffer setbacks and challenges. But peace of mind is precious at every season in life, every position in society, every level of ability, because it blesses you wherever you are in life. And this we know because we see, we watch on TV and so on and so forth, people who have all the things that I've just mentioned, money and fame and power and all those things, and, 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 and they end up committing suicide and they end up harming themselves or drinking themselves to death or doping themselves to death. And you wonder, why well, that person had everything. Why would they do that? I suspect they did that because the one thing they needed they didn't have, and that was peace of mind. Peace of mind. Now, you know, we can touch money, we can count it, you know, and we can experience power and we can enjoy the energy of youth, but peace of mind is more difficult to describe, more difficult to define, and many have tried. The Roman orator Cicero said that peace was freedom in tranquility. And Augustine described it as the final good of man. One old proverb defines peace as not the absence of conflict from life, but the ability to cope with it. The ancient writers and the modern thinkers all search to define and analyze not only what peace of mind is, but more importantly, how do we obtain it? Because just describing it doesn't mean you have it. The Jews in the Old Testament period put such a high premium on this state that their main personal greeting was a word which signified this precious gift. The word shalom meant health and prosperity and well-being, but especially it meant peace be unto you and it was used when they were greeting someone or when they were wishing someone farewell. You know, for a small nation like Israel in those days, constantly threatened by other more powerful nations, peace and especially peace of mind was a very important commodity. 
Because of their special calling, the Jewish nation came to understand the character and the purpose of God through revelation. And through the prophets came to realize that peace of mind, that inexplicable, ex uh, elusive state of quiet well-being that allowed a person to weather any storm, face any hardship, the Jews understood that that thing came from God. You couldn't purchase it with money. You, you couldn't learn it from a book. You couldn't develop it through practice. You couldn't create it with drugs or with, with alcohol. Peace of mind was God's peace, the peace that one experienced when one's heart and soul rested securely with God. Isaiah said it this way, he will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in Him, whose thoughts turn often to the Lord. Isaiah 26, three and four. And so peace of mind wasn't something that man offered to God. It isn't like you had, you, know, you cultivated peace of mind and you offered it to God to demonstrate your sincerity or your holiness or your faith. It didn't work that way. Peace of mind was something that God offered to man in exchange for man's knowledge of and trust in an all-powerful and loving God. You see, we offer up the trust and He sends down the peace. Now, we need to be careful not to confuse peace of mind with satisfaction. Easy to confuse these two ideas, peace of mind, satisfaction. Let's talk about satisfaction for a moment, shall we? Satisfaction is the feeling that we experience when we accomplish something, when we accomplish a task. We feel a, a sense of accomplishment or pleasure because a task has been completed. We have reached an objective. We have fulfilled some kind of need. A lot of people, you know, they stay busy going from one task to another task in order to reinforce that feeling of satisfaction. And many times they confuse this with peace of mind. And this becomes evident in their life when there's nothing to do. Because when there's nothing to do, they then become unhappy. If there's no to-do list to check off constantly, you know, all of a sudden that stops, all of a sudden, so does the satisfaction, so does the feeling of you know, happiness. And so satisfaction is the sense of well-being we have when our needs are being met, whether they be physical or emotional, social or financial. And to experience satisfaction, you know, this is a great thing. It's the natural way to know when we have had enough. God has designed us in such a way that we feel satisfaction, but the purpose of it is to let us know, okay, it's good, it's full, we're, 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 we're complete. But we mustn't confuse satisfaction and the pursuit of it with peace of mind, because if we do, we will never be at rest. The one who seeks for satisfaction always is never Never at rest. You know the to-do list? There's always something on the to-do list. It never ends. Peace of mind, on the other hand, is also a feeling, but it's a feeling of balance. It's a sense of harmony in our lives between the physical and the spiritual. It is a feeling of quiet assurance that despite what is happening on the outside of our lives, the inside of our minds and the inside of our hearts are calm and are at rest. Peace of mind enables us to have the freedom from the need to win all the time or having to perform our act all the time. You know what I'm talking about when I talk about our act? There's the us that we act out the us that everybody knows because we put that outside person on, we put on our act, there's that person, and then there's the real person, the real us, when we kind of remove that and hang that up in the closet when we're all by ourselves, there's that person. 
When we have peace of mind, we can leave that act in the closet. We don't have to put that on. When we have peace of mind, we don't have to feel guilty all the time. We don't have to be afraid of everything all the time. Peace of mind as a state of being is the prelude to joy. You, you cannot experience joy if you have not yet obtained peace of mind. Peace of mind is also a prelude to meaningful relationships with other people. You see, without peace of mind, we're too busy winning all the time, or acting all the time, or being afraid to have a meaningful relationship with another person. And of course, you cannot have true courage without peace of mind. In ancient times when they built castles, they would also build deep wells within the castle walls. This idea was, or the idea rather, was that in times of war, the attackers would often try to cut off the water supply coming from a river or an aqueduct in an effort to defeat the castle dwellers through thirst. But the castles with deep wells within the garrison, however, they were safe from these tactics, having an accessible water supply from within. Peace of mind is like that deep well that constantly nourishes the soul from within, even as a conflict rages on on the outside. You know, when I was a kid, the Rolling Stones became famous singing the song entitled, I Can't Get No. You people are old. <laughs> I can't get no satisfaction. And it seems that the entire generation that followed them and grew up singing that song for the most part looking for satisfaction and not getting any because they didn't understand that what they needed was peace of mind, not satisfaction. So how do you, how do you obtain it? It's easy to talk about it, but how do you actually obtain it? As much as I'd like to, I cannot play God. I cannot give you peace of mind, but I can tell you who does and how you can receive it. First of all, Jesus Christ is the only one who can give you peace of mind. If peace of mind were a thing or a commodity, only Jesus would be able to have it and give it. The passage that we read before is from John where Jesus says, peace I leave with you. Notice he says, my peace. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And there's something not written there that is meant there. Remove the trouble and remove the fear from your hearts and replace it with the peace that I give you. If peace of mind were something that could be exchanged only Jesus would have it. You know, this passage is, passage is familiar. We know, we know Jesus has promised us this peace of mind, but how did they, and consequently, how, did we, how do we receive it? You know, here he's talking to the apostles. He's saying something directly to them and indirectly to us. So we have the answer for this particular question. You know, how do we receive the peace of mind that Jesus is talking about here? It's in John, the same passage, but it's in verse 26. In verse 26 he goes on to say, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And then he goes on to say, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Jesus promised that He would send them the Holy Spirit who would bring them into the knowledge and remembrance of His words. 
I believe that this knowledge and this understanding that would finally bring peace of mind and in the same way brings us peace of mind. See what I'm saying? He says, I'm going to give you peace. And then he says, I I'm going to send you the Spirit. He's the one that brings the peace. It isn't the sound or the composition or the repetitious of the words themselves that bring peace, you know, like some kind of mantra. It's the words and what they represent and teach that bring peace. For example, in Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 24, and I need to go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 24, the writer says the following. He says, when you lie down, uh, there's a misprint up there, but it's chapter three if you're looking for it. It says, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. And when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor of the onslaught of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Solomon here refers to a person who knows God's will and word and the assurance God will protect him. It doesn't say that the wicked will not come. It doesn't say that. It doesn't promise that. It doesn't say, don't worry about it. The, the wicked will never come. It doesn't say that. Maybe the wicked will come. Just do not be afraid of that time because God will be there to protect you when and if this happens. This promise, when believed, brings peace. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In this passage, God assures those who are troubled and wearied by life that if they come to Him, he will support them. Again, notice that he doesn't say, don't worry about it, there'll never be trouble, there'll never be burdens, you know, it'll, be, it'll be a smooth ride all the way through. He doesn't say that. He says, those of you out there who have burdens and struggles, come to me, come to me. Let me carry them for you. For those who come to him, their burden is made lighter. Another passage, Romans chapter five, verse one. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul summarizes just in a few words the fact that by the death of Christ on the cross, he has paid the moral debt for all of our sins. Because of this, God now offers us forgiveness instead of condemnation. When man now thinks of God, he no longer has to dread judgment because he knows in advance that he is okay with God because of Christ. And when we have that thought and when we believe that as true, this knowledge creates a peaceful heart and a peaceful a peaceful mind. Don't ask why modern man does not have peace of mind. Modern man spends I don't know how many hours consuming information from the world on his iPad, iPhone. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How can you have the peace of God in your heart when the majority of the time that you have to consume information, all that we consume comes from the world? I mean, you know me, I'm the last one to kind of put the knock on technology. I'm all about technology. But if we're using today's technology to completely disregard God's word and substitute for it 
an unending, unstoppable flow of information from the world, don't ask why there is no peace of mind. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, my favorite verse, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Another reassurance that God will not condemn us at judgment because we are in Christ, meaning we are Christians. When we see our weak and sinful natures the way that we really are, it is a frightening thing. It is a frightening thing to be absolutely honest with ourselves and examine ourselves. Most of you know that I grew up as a Catholic Went to Catholic school, taught by the nuns in grade school, then taught by the Christian, all boys Christian brothers school. Growing up, served as an altar boy, and, you know, the whole, the whole thing. And I know that there are things about Catholicism you know, that, well, let me just put it this way, are not biblical, let's put it that way. And without meaning to be harsh, I can remember things that were not okay now as an adult and I look back on it, but you know what? I remember some things that were okay. When I was a young boy in grade school, there was a time every week, the nun or the priest who was teaching our class would say, okay, boys and girls, put away your books, put away your pencils, put away your workbooks, clear your desks. And then he would say, I want you now to close your eyes and just put them down on your arms. So you don't see anything, it's just... And then he would go through the Ten Commandments and he would ask us to think about these commandments and review our week to see how did we do? How were we doing in obeying God and obeying the things that God wanted us to obey? That was a tremendous life experience for me as a young boy. And it built into me this habit of reflecting on my own conduct and thought against the mirror of God's word. Now that's a two-edged sword. If you do not firmly have the gospel grasped in this hand, you better not grab the mirror and look into it with this hand because it'll be quite frightening. You will see things that are not pretty. But if you have the gospel in this hand, if you have Romans 8 chapter 1 in this hand, and you are firmly convinced that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, looking in the mirror with this hand only leads you to joy and thanksgiving. And I might add, peace of mind. Yes, this is me and it's not very pretty, but yes, thanks be to God, this is also me, the one that God does not condemn. And then in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, John says, if we confess our sins, that's the mirror, that's the mirror, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. That's the no con condemnation part. That's the gospel part. When you've messed up for the thousandth time, you know, you said, I'm not going to do that anymore. I will not do that. I will not lose my temper. I will not, I will not do, I'm going to be a better person. For the thousandth time, you've made that promise to yourself and you've broken it. Don't these words in 1 John bring you comfort? And reassurance that God continues to love you and forgive you and bless you despite your failures? This creates peace within that no person or action can take away. Now these passages, I've only read a few and many others, tell us of God's absolute power and wisdom and love and willingness 
And you know the, the comfort that I get? When I read the scriptures, I see that God is eager to forgive me. As eager as I am to condemn myself, He is much more eager to forgive me, to transform me, to help me, to supply my needs, and eventually resurrect me from the dead to an everlasting, an everlasting. He's eager to do this for us. The knowledge that we are forgiven for our sins, this brings peace of mind. The assurance that God knows and cares about our failures and heartaches and sustains us nevertheless, this brings peace of mind. The instruction that guides us in living good and productive and spirit-filled lives, this brings peace of mind. The promise that God Himself will provide for us in every instance, every instance, this brings peace of mind. Money or power or intelligence can get us many things, but they can never obtain peace of mind. Peace of mind is created from the knowledge and the assurances and the instructions and promises that God gives and all of these things are contained in God's word and the only way that we can obtain peace of mind is when this knowledge and these promises become ours as we read and respond with faith and obedience to them. In other words, you could say, the peace of God into your heart when the God of peace is on your mind through the word. So let me summarize by saying the following. What we all desperately need to be happy and fulfilled in this life is peace of mind. That state of being that sees us with a quiet assurance of our hearts. A situation where we are in harmony with God, we're in harmony with ourselves, we're in harmony with other people. An attitude whereby whatever is happening on the outside, good or bad, does not disturb the still water. You know that deep well I was talking about? Whatever's happening on the outside cannot dry up the deep well that's on the inside. Secondly, this peace of mind is something that only God can create and that only God can give. Man cannot create it and cannot obtain it through his own efforts. And God does create it. He creates it through the revelation of Himself, through the offer of forgiveness through Jesus Christ, through the promise of love and grace for all, and through the assurance of eternal life to those who believe. And God does offer it through the recording of all these things in His word. You know, that card that you fill out, you know, attendance card, it's important. You know, the elders use that to who's here, who's not here, who's sick, who's not sick. You know, it's, we always encourage you to fill that out. It's kind of a, a communication line between the congregation and the elders. There's one little thing in the corner there. RBR, regular Bible reader. And a lot of people kind of circle that or put a number there, meaning I am a regular Bible reader. I read my Bible at least three times a week. And, or maybe my husband and I, you know, well, there's two Bible readers. And you know, usually you know, we're about, 400 and, about 425 people in this congregation, give or take. But that RBR totals no more than 60 a week. 60 out of 420. And we wonder, why is it that I don't have peace of mind? <laughs> why is it that I'm so troubled? Why is it that I'm so stressed? It's math. 60, 70 out of 420 are drinking in on a regular basis the thing that can give them peace of mind. So all those who read and believe God's word 
will have this peace that surpasses understanding that Paul spoke of in Philippians. Now for some this morning, this message simply confirms what they have known and experienced all their Christian lives. I'm not saying that no one has peace of mind here, of course not. Many of us, with each passing day in Christ, the word continues to reassure and to strengthen, to create a deeper and more secure peace of mind in your hearts. And I rejoice with you and I praise God for the blessings that you enjoy because your hearts are at peace in Christ. If you are in peace with God, say amen. 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 But there may be some, however, who are not at peace, some whose hearts are troubled, who would love to be at rest and enjoy the state of mind that I've described this morning. And so the first step for you is to surrender your hearts to Jesus Christ and allow Him to forgive your sins so that you can be at peace with God. And this you can do by calling on His name and repenting of your sins, being, being baptized in the name of Christ. And then the next step is to grow in the understanding of God's word and do what it says so that God can create in you an everlasting peace that nothing, not even death, can take away from you. And so if you're not at peace this morning, if you're not at peace, remove those things in your life that are blocking you from experiencing the peace of mind that every heart desires. I encourage you, please, Obey the gospel and be baptized. Or be reconciled to your brother, or to your family, or to your church, and ask God to forgive you right now for those things that you may have done or neglected to do. And come and receive the prayers of the church to help you deal with your struggles. I leave you today with the ancient Hebrew blessing of Shalom. And I say to you, please, do not leave this place this morning without God's peace in your heart. Come and renew and receive the peace of God as we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement. If you need God's peace, please come now.